All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is Node.js, not just for the cool kids. So by that, I mean that we're not really going to cover like server-side Node.js. We're more interested in front-end build tools and the funness that is NPM. So if you were here and you expected to learn how to build like APIs and such, you can probably just go on home, I guess. <laughs> All right, just so you don't have to write stuff down, I've got two links, one to the slides as PDFs, and the other one with just the links from the presentation, because a lot of times that's really all you really want. All right, I am Zach Hawkins. I'm the theming manager at MediaCurrent. Live in Athens, Georgia, not too far away. Um, two kids, and love talking about front end stuff, scalable, maintainable, front end architecture, and all that stuff. Also, I figured out Google Docs won't work if you don't have an internet connection. So last night when I didn't, I was trying to work on it. Can't do it. So as I said before, I work for Media Current. We build awesome, big scale, maintainable websites in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And today we're gonna go over kind of an intro to Node and NPM. Uh, this is going to be a very brief intro, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we use Node at Media Current on the front end side, and we'll look at tips and tricks. So just stuff that, from doing this over time, like things that I've figured out that either make my life easier or problems and stuff to work around. And then the very last, um, there's other stuff you can look at on the internet related to this, and I will have um, links of that. So. First, introduction to Node and NPM. So I think before we talk about what Node.js is, it's important to say what it isn't. And it's not a web framework, like something like Rails. And it's not a programming language. So the language is JavaScript. Um, so that's what it's not. So what is it? It's a project that's designed to help you write JavaScript programs that talk to the network, file systems, and other input and output sources. So what's it best used for? Writing these network programs using like HTTP and SSL and all that fun stuff that I don't really understand. Um, but the second part is where I'm more interested in it, and that's programs that read and write data to the file system or local process memory. So that's build tools. That's stuff that's reading files that are locally on your machine doing stuff to compile them or transpile them in other ways. So what's NPM? It's a manager for node modules. Um, it comes bundled with Node.js. So whenever you install Node, NPM comes along for the ride and use it to download the entire world. So let's look at a package.json file. So this is the, I guess, the root file uh, in a node module. And there's a lot more, there's a lot more to go over here, I think, but I've pulled out the most interesting things as far as what I'm mainly concerned about. So within the package.json, you've got normal stuff like name, version, um, and all that funness, but you also have scripts. So these are, allow you to run additional commands. Um, and dependencies and dev dependencies. So the difference between these two things, uh, dependencies are stuff that your project needs to actually work. So if you were working on an Angular project, dependencies, Angular's gonna be the dependency because it will not load in the browser without Angular. Dev dependencies is stuff you need to work. So if you're using SAS, SAS doesn't care about the browser, but you do. So you wanna make sure that you install the dev dependencies there, and NPM breaks them up like that so that later on in different environments, you can install only what you need um, uh, without any of the dev stuff. For Drupal, though, um, and building Drupal themes using different build tools in NPM and Node, you don't have too many dependencies. You can use NPM like you would use Bowser, or um, I mean Bower, to install like jQuery or something like that. In this case, Magnific pop-up. Um, you can use it 
in that way. A lot of times we don't, uh, but you could. And if you did require jQuery in that way, um, that would definitely be a dependency. So one of the hard things to kind of get your head around whenever you're starting out in Node is the difference between globally installed and locally installed modules. I guess uh, I saw it described, I think, maybe not best, but it made sense in my mind in a blog post where they said, say you had like a Word document from like 95, right? You wouldn't expect to be able to open up that document in whatever the most recent one is now because there would be a version conflict, right? So even though it's the same kind of file maybe and at one time was the same software, it's definitely not anymore. So installing modules locally means that you're installing modules that are only sp defined in one place, um, only defined within your project. So they're local to whatever project you're working on. Um, so globally installed stuff, that's like Word. Like if you were installing Word and you had brand new Word, you couldn't open the really old stuff because you have brand new Word. Um, so that's installing stuff globally. So if you were to install a node module globally, um, it would be system-wide, and it would not be for a specific project. So it's, it's confusing for sure. Um, you have to install modules with the G flag to install them globally. Otherwise, they just install locally. That's the default. Um, and the gotcha here is, if you want to run stuff on the command line, you have to install it globally. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to kind of get around that later, um, because you don't want other people on your team to have to like, hey, whenever you check out this project, I need you to npm install this and npm install that and add a dash g and then all that other fun stuff. Yeah, you don't want to do that. So here's how you get around that. So running locally installed modules from the command line. You can point to the node modules bin file. So like if you were running ESLint, you could just put this in your command line, ESLint, and then pass in any parameters. So it knows that, hey, I'm using this program to run that. But that looks kind of wonky. You can also use the npm bin um, command, but that also looks really weird and wonky. So my favorite way to do this is to add an npm script. So on the left side, at the very top, you see build, compile, watch, style guide, compress, lint, and clean on the left side. So those are npm scripts. So I can say npm run and then the script name. And in turn, for me, it's going to run that command on the command line for me. So it's going to use whatever local modules I have installed. So in this case, I don't have Gulp installed globally. I only have it installed locally. But NPM is going to go ahead and run Gulp for me without me having to do anything specific. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, too. There is some hot drama. And I'll let y'all read this later. Uh, long story short, I guess, uh, kick. I guess they do like messaging or something like that. Anyways, they wanted a uh, node module name on NPM, and they couldn't resolve it between the original developer. So NPM gave the name over to Kick, and um, the developer kind of like rage unpublished all his node modules. And one of those, LeftPad, was um, a dependency of many big projects like Babel and such. So all of a sudden, all these people have these continuous integration tasks that are installing these node modules each time. And all of a sudden, that module was unpublished. So stuff broke. Um, so anyways, it broke the internet. Yep. Uh, anyways, uh, I've got that in the, the slide notes. If you want to read more, it's fun. And NPM has taken. Um, steps, I guess, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Uh, and in that blog post, they kind of talk about what happened and how they resolved it and so on. So it's fun. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about how we use Node at Media Current. Uh, we use it through Node Version Manager. 
NDM. And this allows us to run multiple versions of Node and specific to each project. Um, often we'll receive either, you know, a support client who comes to us and they already have some, something set up, maybe using a really old version of Node. So we'll generally add whatever version we need to run that um, with an MDM uh, with Node Version Manager. So that way we can make sure that from project to project, we can always use the correct version that's not breaking stuff. Um, from what I, I, I've talked to some people that write Node apps and all that fun stuff, and they said they don't really worry about it because after a certain point, the compatibility is pretty good. But that doesn't really work for us because we're working with a lot of like legacy projects and stuff that come up with Node version, you know, 12 or 0 0.11. Um, but yeah, so this allows switching between versions per project. And you can add a little NVMRC file with, and all it contains is the version number within it. And then NVM can pick up that file, read it, and make sure it uses the right version or installs the right version. We use NPM scripts. So um, personally, I use post install scripts to clean up the node modules install uh, so Drupal doesn't break, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, but also, as I pointed out too, I like to map task runner commands to NPM scripts. So instead of running gulp straight up on the command line, you're running an NPM script that's then running gulp. Uh, we use gulp which is a node module. Um, we use it to do lots of fun stuff. If you're not familiar, uh, we use it to compile SAS, transpile, ES 2015, lint SAS and JS. Um, it's all sorts of other things. Watches files and recompiles, compresses files, and et cetera. Uh, we also use libsas, which is the node, uh, which is node SAS, I guess is what we use, but it's uh, libsas. And if you aren't familiar, you know, that allows us to do fun SAS stuff, like use variables, mixins, functions, and so on. Um, and also, and I'll put right there on the bottom, like, if you are familiar with SAS, it lets us do all the fun stuff, or sorry, <laughs> all the fun SAS stuff that at first I was excited about and went overboard with, and then I regretted it, and now I'm back to the same level of abstraction. So I have very strong feelings about that. You could ask me about that later. We use Yeoman to scaffold out new themes. And this kind of saves us from like having to like copy and paste boilerplate from project to project and change names and do like bulk find and replace and all that fun stuff. That's not fantastic. Uh, we also have some Yeoman sub-generators to quickly frame out smaller repeatable pieces of a project. So by that, uh, say, we're breaking up our project into like CSS components, components, and each component needs a twig file, a SAS file, and maybe a dummy JSON file for style guide or something. Uh, we can, we've got that available as a sub-generator so we can run a command and it just spit out that with whatever name we pass it, which has been really helpful. Uh, we use KSS Node, which is a style guide generator, and it reads specially formatted CSS comments within the SAS, in our case, and then uses Twig to generate a living style guide. So as you're working on it, um, it keeps regenerating, and you, it should, in theory, always be up to date with what you're working on. Um, and we've used it before to prototype kind of flat pages just for to like client sign off and that sort of thing. Which is useful when usually no designs are available and they just tell us to m make it responsive. All right, so here's the fun part, tips and tricks. And this is stuff that I've just picked up along the way that I thought might be helpful for others. Drupal and Node.js, and specifically, running node modules inside a local Drupal install. We don't run node modules inside a uh, production server or environment, right? This is only for local development, and this is unlikely to affect any developers on the team, uh, but it does affect me and my front end team, so. It's 
kind of hard to see, but that's a fire. I kind of look for a dumpster fire, but I couldn't find a really good dumpster fire photo, so this one will have to do. What I mean by that is there are difficulties. Uh, the segment fault 11 error is a fun one. What happens is Drupal's file scan is picking up these info files that come supplied with some node modules and freaks out and breaks. And in a lot of cases, you'll get like a white screen of death. Um, the solution, it, this should be fixed uh, in Drupal 7.4.0 or 7.4.0, but I saw it Friday in a up-to-date Drupal site. Um, a good way to test this out is if all of a sudden Drush breaks, you're trying to like Drush clear the cache and it's throwing you like seven fault errors and stuff. And you're like, what is this nonsense? Um, delete your node modules folder or move it and reload and see if it reloads and bam, usually that's the case. Um, a possible solution is to add a post install script to delete node module info files like this. Um, so what's happening is after you run npm install, it will run this post install hook. So it's gonna look in node modules folder. It's gonna find a file that has a .info in the name and make sure it's a file. And then it's gonna delete it. And yes, I know that's probably a bad idea to delete stuff in node modules folders, but it works. Um, from the little research I've done on it, um, it seems that the info file is related to something testing and shouldn't actually break anything um, module wise. We've had good luck with it, um, but it's part of a bigger problem. Bigger problem is Drupal file scan. Uh, basically, Drupal file scan attempts to scan all of the node modules folder. And depending on what version of NPM you're using, sometimes those things can be nested eternally, like all the way down. Um, a lot of times you'll be like, man, this site takes forever to load. I'm trying to like drush CC all and it's just sitting there. I don't know what's going on. And the developers on the team are like, I don't know, man, like it's fine for me. Did you try clearing cache? And you're like, that's the problem. I can't clear cache. Um, but anyways, in Drupal 8, this should be fixed in 8.2.dev or whatever it is. And there is a patch in uh, a Drupal 7 patch here that's in review. And uh, so this is an, a problem that people know about and they've put effort into like fixing it. Um, and yes, yeah, so this solution, the patch that's in this file and the other one, also fixed the previous problem. So if Drupal doesn't scan the node modules directory, then Drupal never finds those info files and Drupal doesn't break. So instead of deleting .info files, if you just tell Drupal to ignore it, um, you don't have issues. If you have to use sudo to install node modules, something is forked. Yep, so if you're like npm install, and then it gives you permissions errors, and then you're like, fine, sudo npm install, and then it works, well, it's forever gonna be borked. Um, Best case scenario is like you just take a step back, uninstall node in NPM, and reinstall it again, which is easier said than done. So there's actually this script here that will do that for you. Uninstall it, and this, and this is an excellent time to switch to NVM, it, node version manager, if you weren't already using it. Use NPM shrink wrap. So on the right side, you see where it has, it says like gulp, and there's a little arrow, and then it says 3.9.1. That means install gulp that's compatible with this version. So that's not tying it to a specific version. So it's, it's likely that the version that you install and the version that your teammate installs could be two very different versions. Or maybe not very different, but different enough that all of a sudden you're like, hey, I'm running into error, what's going on? And they say, I don't, I don't have an error. Um, see that stuff all the time. So you're probably sitting there thinking like, well, that's easy. I'll just remove the little arrow, carrot thing, 
and then I'll, it'll just 3.1 or 3.9.1 and problem accomplished. Um, not exactly, uh, because that node module has lots of other dependencies, and you're not locking down those dependencies. They're stated similar to how it's stated here. So it's even if you lock down this exact version, that's not locking down the dependencies of all the node modules folders. Um, but that's what shrink wrap is for. So shrink wrap is for locking down all of the dependencies um, within your module, everything, um, dependencies, dependencies, and so on. But if you do it by default, it'll just save the um, just the main dependencies and not the dev dependencies because shrink wrap is used to trying to deploy this stuff in a production environment and it knows it doesn't need dev dependencies if you're deploying in a, a production environment. Um, but for us, going from person to person and wanting someone else to be able to pick up our theme, run all the commands and everything work, we need to save those dev dependencies. So they're getting the exact same version of SAS, build, et cetera. So that's why you use the dash dev. Um, unfortunately, and this is, I guess, more of kind of a bug in NPM that I've seen uh, GitHub issues about is that you have to rerun the shrink wrap command after adding new modules. So if you're working on something and you're like, ah, oh, crap, I gotta install something else because I really need whatever it is. If you install it, um, it won't automatically update the shrink wrap file if you're saving dev dependencies. It will do it if you're saving normal dependencies because it's smart, but if you're trying to save dev dependencies, it won't do it. Um, yeah, but use shrink wrap. It'll make your life easier. And here's what a shrink wrap file looks like. That is the only gift from my presentation. Um, you are welcome. <laughs> All right, so what about node modules? Um, shrink pack, let's talk about this. And I haven't actually used shrink pack, but I think it's really powerful and a great idea. And um, I wanted to throw it in here because it's, it's Interesting. So what shrink pack does is maintains a node shrink wrap directory inside your project that has all the tarballs that npm installs whenever you run npm install. The install process is exactly the same. The only difference is that it doesn't reach out to the internet and download stuff. It's only installing it locally. Um, so for like continuous integration stuff, where you have a, a job on your server um, that needs to download all those dependencies and then do stuff, and then, hey, wait a minute, what if um, the registry, the NPM registry has some sort of like CDN issue or something like that and the URL won't resolve, well, all of a sudden our process is broke. But with shrink pack, it doesn't have to be, you could, use shrink pack to just have it install local things and kind of um, abstract that out a little bit. And I really like this idea. I really like the idea of not having to be connected onto uh, the internet in order to download your NPM modules if you're like on a plane or something or just at a conference trying to connect to Wi-Fi, sort of stuff. Um, abstract build tasks with NPM scripts. Talked a little bit about this earlier. I thought this was a very appropriate uh, image for this. And I don't think you can read the very top, but it says, this time you have definitely chosen the right libraries and build tools, because it definitely feels like that. <laughs> All right, so as we said earlier, through NPM scripts, we're kind of abstracting out these build tasks. Um, and I've done my best to kind of figure out the normal stuff that we do on projects and to pick a, a script name for those. So we went with build, compile, watch, style guide, compress, lint, and clean. Um, build being kind of the default command, just like running gulp and gulp will run whatever default gulp tasks are available. And then the other ones call actual task. So, you know, compile, calls, gulp, compile, and so on. So you could call these one-off ones if you wanted to. So whenever you run 
npm run build on the command line, it'll turn around and run gulp for you. If you run npm run compile, you know, it'll turn around and run gulp compile and so on. Um, so what's the advantages of this? Commands can be consistent from project to project. And this is really powerful, mainly because whenever you're trying to ramp someone onto a project, you're always like, okay, okay, hold on, here's how to compile SAS. You have to install Bundler. If you don't have the gem installed, did you install RVM? You probably need RVM installed. Um, do you have Node installed? Hopefully it's the right version of Node. Did you NPM install everything? Uh, just RM, RF, the Node modules folder, and then NPM install it again. Yeah, good times. Um, but with consistent commands like this, like build, compile, and watch, just something that you'll know you'll always need a task for, you can keep those consistent from project to project. So on every project, someone will know that, hey, to get started, I need to make sure that I'm using the right version of Node with NVM, Node Version uh, Manager. And then I can NPM install my dependencies. And then I can run um, these build um, tasks. So NPM run build, that does the same thing I expect it to do. Uh, tasks or tools can be changed as needed and the commands stay the same. So the example I have here uh, is actually a client that we have. Um, they're still using uh, Compass and um, Ruby SAS, but we had to put, I forget why we added NPM into the project, but it was for another reason. And while I was there, I was like, well, shoot, I can just keep things consistent and go ahead and map our commands so the next person that comes onto the project, they can still run npm run build or npm run compile or whatever, and it's gonna do the exact same thing. Like, they don't have to know that we're running gulp, they don't have to know that we're running grunt, like, they don't have to know that we're running broccoli, and that's not a made up thing. Broccoli is a task runner and it does exist. Um, they don't have to know any of that. And if these tools ever change from project to project, because front-end tools never change and stay consistent, um, they don't need to worry about if they're running gulp and what commands to throw in. They can use the same NPM script each time, and it'll work just fine. So I know what you're thinking. You're like, wow, NPM scripts. Well, shoot, let's just like make NPM scripts for everything and we don't even need gulp and grunt. Like this, I, I totally went through that too. And this is definitely where, um, where I ended up as well. Basically like, hey, I just need to do this one thing. I'm just gonna have an NPM script that just runs um, critical CSS and that's all it's gonna do. Okay, now I need one that just compresses that and that's all it's gonna do. Man, I just need one, and it goes on and goes on until finally you're like, well, crap, I could have just added gulp, and then it would be a lot easier to read, and someone else can maintain it. So and that's about it. I've got a list of things to look at on the internet. If you actually want to learn Node, whoa, I squished it together. If you actually want to learn Node, and you sat through all of this, thank you, <laughs> but uh, Art of Node, is a great guide for that. Um, Node.js best practices is interesting as well. And Node School is really neat. Node School is like um, all through the command line, learn stuff through the command line. It's interesting. But if you just want to mess with build tools, there's some great articles as well. Um, choosing Grunt, NPM, or Gulp. And there's also a great blog post about getting started with NPM, Node Package Manager, and then getting started with Gulp as well. And uh, the Gulp GitHub repo has a lot of great resources and examples for like how to do stuff. And that is it. Y'all can clap, that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, I uh, won't cycle, it's fine. Yeah, but if there's any questions, I think we, Still have a little bit of time if y'all aren't in a hurry to drive home or anything.